before we go on to Joshua 6. But we finally got there, in a sense. We haven't finally got there. We're still getting there. But we've crossed over the Jordan. We've spent a little while with God preparing his people. Keep saying, they didn't go straight in. They didn't take the advantage of surprise and having crossed over to go straight and attack Jericho. The Lord wanted to prepare them. And God's world and the way God works and in the spiritual life is nothing like just a normal human life. It is in a sense, we still get up every day, we still have to eat and everything like that. We, you know, we still live a life, we go out to jobs and things. But there's an extra realm and in that realm God operates in a completely different way. He doesn't do what all the best people and clever people and strategists and everything would do. When you made everything, when you know everything, when you've already seen the future and everything that's going to happen, even if it's not happened yet, you think completely differently. And it was far more important that God prepared the people spiritually in their heart than they went up straight away and attacked the city. So we've looked at the fact they built a memorial, the stones, and it was important them to acknowledge what God had done in bringing them that far and in finally bringing them into the land and in crossing over the Jordan and the miracle there. It was important. Then we looked last time at they were all, well not, all because they hadn't been carrying out some of the um, laws and duties they should have carried out as Jewish people to their God. They had to circumcise all the people that were born during the period of the wilderness that hadn't been done, all the um, males. And then we looked, they celebrated the Passover, which again, they hadn't done while they were in the wilderness. And again, they were putting back in place all the things God had commanded them to do that they'd stopped during the period that they went around the wilderness for 40 years. But God has now finally got them ready and they're about finally to go in. But there's one thing that God wants to do for Joshua. Joshua chapter 5, verse 13. It came to pass, while Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked. Behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? So he said, No, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take off your sandal off your foot, for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. They're about to go, in a sense, on the biggest battle they've ever been on. Even bigger than when we read before, when we were looking at Moses' life, the battle where Joshua led it and Moses stood on the hillside with his arms in the air, with the staff in his hands. And when his hands, when they were, his hands hung down loose, they lost the battle. When his hands raised up, they won the battle. And Aaron and Hur coming and holding his arm, Moses' his arms up. Bigger than that battle is what is about to come. And Joshua doesn't know it, but the Lord knows it. Joshua needs this encounter with God. Joshua would not put it down on his list of things I need to do before the battle, but God knows and God wants to encourage him, but also remind him actually whose battle this is. Who's the one who's really going to win it and fight it? Joshua looks up and sees a man standing opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. 
what does he first think? It's about to go and attack a city. Presumably doesn't look like one of his men. Is it going to be one of the enemy? Is it somebody coming to try and fight him and take him out before the battle? Take the leader out, you've got a good chance of winning the battle. And I think he genuinely asks, I'm not sure at that point he realises who it is. Are you for us or for adversaries? Which side are you on? You with your sword drawn in front of me. Am I about to get my own out and fight you? Are you somebody who's come to help us? The person answers. And just because sometimes we get a bit confused as who they are, they put the words in capitals. When you get the words in capitals, you know who they mean. I've come as commander of the capital of the army of the Lord of the capital. I have now come. This is God himself appearing to Joshua. What often happened in the Old Testament, or sometimes, that's rare in a sense, God would appear, God in a sense, in a pre-incarnate form of Jesus. It would appear as a person in a human form, sort of Jesus appearing but having not yet come in baby form and grown up. But God would appear, there's other episodes in the Old Testament where God appears in this way. Sometimes he's called the Angel of the Lord of the capital A, an L. God appears, and God appears here in front of Joshua as the commander of the army of the Lord. I've now come. Not just commander in the sense of the army as in your army, Joshua. The commander of God's army. The commander of the heavenly host. I've now come. Notice he doesn't exactly answer Joshua's question. I mean, if you want to know it's God or even that it's a, a person like Jesus, somebody asks you a question, don't directly answer it. <laughs> That's just Jesus we've seen all through Matthew when we've looked at it. I don't need to directly answer your question. I'll just tell you who I am. I am. Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped. Joshua then knew by his words who this was. This is the Lord he'd followed all his life to this point. This is the Lord he'd interacted with in the um, tabernacle when he used to spend a lot of time in there. He knew who this was. The right reaction, could he have some... I mean, I think if you ever met God like that in a way, we'd fall on our faces. You wouldn't have a choice. There wouldn't be a thing going on in your head, am I going to bow the knee or something to this? If you suddenly in the face of the presence of God, you'd fall on your knees automatically. What does my Lord say to his servant? The commander of the Lord's army just said to Joshua, take off your sandal off your foot. The place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. Again, there's other places in the Old Testament people God meets with or they know. They take off their shoes because it's holy ground. He doesn't directly answer the question, but in a sense here, Joshua knows. God and God's army is with us on this battle we're about to do. He's on their side. But it's also a bit God's reminding him, because what they're going to do here is exceedingly weird when they come to Jericho. And God's going to say something, and they really are going to have to decide, is that God, and am I going to do what he's said? Even though it goes against every logical thought in your head. So chapter 6, we finally come, we finally stand, looking down on the city of Jericho. Now Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel. None went in and none went out. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I've given Jericho into your hand, its king and the mighty men of valour. 
You shall march around the city, all you men of war. You should go all around the city once. This you should do for six days. And seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. But the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. It shall come to pass when you make a long blast with the ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people shall shout with a great shout. Then the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up, every man straight before him. Forty years ago, before they went into the wilderness, twelve spies had gone into this same land. They'd gone up and down this land. They'd seen Jericho, they'd seen the other cities. Ten of them had come back and said their cities are so strong, so fortified. There's giants there. There's no way we can take this land. Because of it, as we've said many, they ended up going through the wilderness for 40 years. Now they're back, back in that land again, but back now ready, prepared, all in agreement, ready now to attack Jericho. Jericho, it says, is, is well fortified. I mean, it's, it's all shut up now. All the people, so like presumably most you, you see and read about cities in those days, a lot of people lived outside the city walls, all the farmers and all the people managing the land, the animals and everything. But when anything like this happened, they gathered them all up. They brought them all in and all the families and everybody into the city, inside the city walls. They shut the gates up. They were secure. But Jericho is not that big a city. It's about seven acres, which doesn't mean anything to me. Might mean something to my dad. But... Uh, it's about one kilometre. To walk round the city of Jericho is about one kilometre. It's not even a mile. It will take you about, says about half an hour. If there's a few tens and thousands of you, maybe it'll take you a bit long, longer to get yourselves organised. It's a very short march just to go round the city. Now, there were two strategies in those days there were two ways that you took a city that had shut itself up and didn't want to be taken by the enemy. You'd attack it. You could try digging under the walls. You could try punching through the walls. You could try climbing over the walls. Somehow you'd got to get through those walls. Dig or, or um, punch through, break the wall down, get ladders or ropes or something and climb over it or alternatively you could surround the city and starve them out you waited long enough days and weeks they'd ate everything that there was of any food and anything they got they couldn't get out the city to replenish any more you'd eventually starve the people out so weak you could just go and take the city two common strategies so what do they do? What does God say? We're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to do something a little bit strange. You and the men of war, and we'll read in a minute, and the priests and the Ark of the Covenant, not everybody, I don't think, the note's saying, and you get the wording gives a little bit of that, that the men of war will go round. It's not everybody of the hundreds of thousands or possibly two million that crossed over the Jordan. You're not going to take all the women and kids and animals around with you. And actually, if they did that, they'd surround the city anyway. You wouldn't be able to go around in a circle because you'd surround the thing anyway with that many people for, for, for one kilometre. You're going to walk around the city in complete silence once a day. Then you're going to go back to your tents and your camp, wait 23 hours, <laughs> say it took an hour to go around it. Tomorrow you're going to get up, you're going to line up, tens of thousands of people, 
going to walk around the walls again in silence and you're going to do that for six days and then on the seven something will happen God's a God of the number seven it said there's about 25 times the number seven is mentioned in this chapter seven is the number of completeness in the Bible interesting as well God has gone against himself a bit Six days God created the earth, the seventh he rested. Commands us, that's why we have, even now, in a sense, the Sabbath or Sunday or whatever. Even, even in, you know, in our world as such. <laughs> Six days you're going to run. The seventh you're going to work. The seventh you're going to have, but in a sense, the seventh you're going to have the victory. The seventh day is the day it's all going to happen. And you're going to take this city. So in a sense, it's a bit strange to do the biggest thing on the seventh day. But it's because God's going to bless them on that day. This is really, really, you know, this is everything. This is important. And they've got what it is you go around. What, what, what would they be thinking as they march around? You've got to be careful, because the en- so the enemy are going to be frightened. They're frightened you've come right up to their gates and everything. They're all locked up and set up inside. They don't know what's going to happen and what you're going to do. They probably think, because you haven't immediately started digging, climbing, something like that, you're probably going to surround them and starve them out. Especially when you do this for seven days. You're not attacking them, you're not doing anything. So you are already starting to weaken them, in a sense, over a week, while they haven't, can't get any fresh food and only whatever water's in the city. So a little bit of that's happening anyway, I suppose. But they're going to be looking over the walls, out the windows, um, you know, looking what's happening. You don't stay in the fortified city and not have an eye on what your enemy are doing, spies watching out and everything. And they're just walking round. They're not saying anything, making any noise. They're not singing, they're not rejoicing they're just walking around the city you'd be confused you're in fear anyway but equally you might start to mock no doubt there were shouts and jeers from the city wall to the Israelites walking around the city you're in danger depending on exactly it doesn't say here how close to the city they were walking if you're walking near enough to the city you're in danger you could get shot with an arrow or something. You could get stuff thrown at you off the walls. So there's also some faith here by the Israelites doing this. They are, in a sense, possibly in danger. But they're going to do what God says and walk round the city. Verse 6. Then Joshua the son of Nun called the priests said to them, take up the Ark of the Covenant. Let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of the Lord. He said to the people, proceed, march around the city, let him who is armed advance before the Ark of the Lord. So it was when Joshua had spoken to the people that the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Lord advanced and blew the trumpets. And the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord followed them, The armed men went before the priests who blew the trumpets and the rear guard came after the ark while the priests continued blowing the trumpets. Now Joshua had commanded the people saying, You shall not shout or make any noise with your voice, nor shall a word proceed out of your mouth until the day I say to you, shout. Then you shall shout. So he had the ark of the Lord circle the city going around it once. And then they came into the camp and lodged in the city. Joshua rose early in the morning and the priest took up the ark of the Lord. Then seven priests bearing seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord went on continually and blew with the trumpets. And the armed men went before them. But the rear guard came after the ark of the Lord while the priests continued blowing the trumpets. And the second day they marched around the city once and returned to the camp. And so they did for six days. Okay, so quite rightly, if you're watching and listening, 
I've just completely contradicted myself, um, which is perfectly okay, because it means I hadn't got this totally in order in my head. So there was a noise. They blew the trumpets. They didn't go around in total silence. There was blowing of trumpets, but equally, there was the don't say or don't shout, don't make any noise with your voice, not a word shall proceed out your mouth. So, I'm half right. <laughs> but that's not a, well, it's not a good thing to be right anyway, before God. But it is a good thing to be right with what you say out the word of God and not to get it all wrong and tell you a load of rubbish or anything. So, the people were to be quiet, but the seven trumpeters were to blow their trumpets. So that would have been quite scary going round to the people watching. Notice again the role of the Ark of the Covenant. This box, this big box that they carried with them everywhere. It had the prominent place when they crossed over the Jordan. The priests stood with it, holding it on their shoulders the whole time that the thousands of people crossed across in front of them. They were the first to put their feet in the Jordan and it parted. They were the last to take their feet out and it closed up. Normally you do not put the Ark of the Covenant, your most holy sacred item that you have in the battle. So here again is something different. It's important, this shows that God is involved with this battle. God is going to win this battle, not them. In fact, in some ways, until the walls fall down, they go in, they're not going to lift a sword, they're not going to lift a shield, they're not going to do anything that would be counted as fighting until it all happens and then they go into the city. And so, the men of war go first, the seven priests with their trumpets, the Ark of the Covenant being carried, and then they're backed up behind also by the um, soldiers. For six days, Joshua rose early in the morning, the priests got ready, the Ark got ready, the army got ready. They marched once round it and came back to camp. But then on the seventh day, there's a bit like waiting, waiting. Six days have done this. I can imagine for the 23 hours apart from sleep, of the in between, they're getting up the next morning and doing it again. There was an awful lot of talking about <laughs> what are we doing, what's going to happen, counting down the days. We've done day one, we've done day two. They're nervous, they're anticipating, they're looking forward to something. But there's a sense in which they know what as well, because God said what would happen. They don't understand how the wall's going to fall down. They probably can't picture in their head the wall's just falling down. But God has says, do this, and on the seventh day, do the seven times, and then something will happen. And their faith is in the word that God has said. Can you imagine being Joshua? It skips over here. Telling the people and explaining to them at the beginning what you're going to do. I'm pretty sure they weren't all just immediately so spiritual that they just, oh, that's brilliant, that's definitely God and everything. I'm quite sure there was a lot of complaining, um, discussing the mental state of Joshua, um, you know, and, and talking about this ridiculous idea. Quite sure they weren't all just 100% happily behind everything but they followed out of obedience out of respect out of honoring that they did believe God spoke to Joshua and so on the seventh day verse 15 came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about the dawning of the day they marched around the city seven times in the same manner and on that day only, they marched around the city seven times. And the seventh time when it happened, when the priests blew the trumpets, 
that Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. Now the city shall be doomed by the Lord to destruction, it and all who are in it. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all who are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. And you by all means abstain from the accursed things, lest you become accursed when you take of the accursed things, and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. But all the silver and gold, and vessels of bronze and iron, are consecrated to the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. And so the people shouted when the priest blew the trumpets. And it happened when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat. Then the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. They utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old, ox and sheep and donkey, with the edge of the sword. The seventh day they rose early, about the dawning of the day. It's going to take longer to walk around the city seven times. Did exactly the same thing, only they did it seven times. Can you imagine as well, I missed this off the early bit. Knowing what we're like as humans, knowing when we've ever done a march or anything for Jesus or something, would it be possible to walk all the round without saying a word? Not a word shall pass out of your mouth. Don't we like to talk to each other on the way round and <laughs> have a bit of a chat and things? It would have been very hard, totally dedicated to what they were doing. They go round seven times on this day, so there's not a great break. They go round, soon they go round and they go round, they go round the seven times. They shouted, the city's already been doomed by the Lord to destruction and all who are in it. And when, so when they went round and they blew the trumpets, the people heard the shout and they gave a great shout because Joshua had now given them permission to that the wall fell down flat. They went up into the city. This is a miracle. Again, crossing the D Jordan was a miracle. The wall of Jericho falling down. Walls do not just fall down. You've made them so well, so strong. They're your city's protection against attack. If you were to try and dig in and punch through and climb over, very, very, very hard to do. You'd be really careful as a, an army conquering a city, thinking about whether you could really do it. Walls do not just, from the top to the bottom, just fall down where they are. God has Ted done what he said he would do, met his promise. Shown the battle is his. But then they have to go in. And, and then they have to go and actually fight. And the Lord warns them as well. We'll come back to Rahab in a minute because she's in the next bit. <clears throat> but, well, we'll do that bit here. So... One of the things that was very, very important, we have to skip back to Joshua 2, I think it was. When they sent the two spies in, they were looked after and cared for by Rahab the prostitute. We amazed and looked the fact that eventually she ends up in the whole lineage of Jesus. And, got, and got, she, she begged at the time, when you come in to because I believe, when you come in and take the city, spare me my family and they negotiated between the two spies and her providing you put a red cord out the window because her, her house was on the wall and a window on the wall of the city put a red cord out so we know which house it is gather your family in your house anybody in your house will be spared not your family in another house not your family down the street at the time if they're in your house they will be spared at the time that we come and attack Beautiful picture there also of the Passover when they put the blood over the doors and lintels of their houses, the first Passover. The angel of the Lord passed over 
all of the houses that had the blood painted on it, not the ones that didn't. Rahab and Joshua had said at the time, when the spies came back and they told him, they told him about Rahab, she looked after us and we made this promise. Joshua says, we will honour that promise. They clearly said to her, they must be in your house, you must put the cord up, you must follow the instructions. But providing you do that, we will spare you. And Joshua said then, and Joshua here is honouring the promise that he's made. They won't get very far with taking Jericho and starting to take the other places from the promised land if here they completely forgot the promise they've made to God and to this lady in a sense who, you know, God is very, very, treats our promises and the things we say with our words way more important than we often do. They had to honour what they'd said. The other thing the Lord said to them, when they go in, they're to destroy everything. Again, you know, we get it because it's war and it's a fight and it's in the past. Some of these things, sometimes you read them, you know, go against our wanting peace and <laughs> not killing people, etc. But we read what's in the Bible. It's what is, it's what happened, it was what was at the time. It still goes on today. Um, they were to destroy their enemy. And to be fair, in some ways, God actually had said previous in the past, God had cursed these people. God was angry with these people outside of the Jews and these nations because these nations followed false gods. They followed um, Baal and Ashtaroth. They set up poles and things and worshipped them. They worshipped false images and everything, all described in, in the Old Testament a lot better. Um, and God had said that because of that, at some stage, punishment would come on them, but he'd held it off. He'd held it off, but now was their time. There's a double thing here of the Lord is going to give his people the promised land, as he said, at the same time he's going to finally carry out his punishment on the other nations. So they're to destroy man and woman, young and old, ox and sheep and donkey with the edge of the sword. But they're also to be careful what they do with the other items. Items of silver and gold, bronze and iron, should be consecrated to the Lord and brought into the treasure of the Lord. You can't kill items. Physical items, gold, silver, everything, you can't get rid of them. You could melt them down if you wanted, you could remake something from them, but you cannot destroy gold once it exists. You can't kill it. And so what they did with these items, they were consecrated to the Lord and brought into the treasury of the Lord. You can't get rid of them, so the best thing to do is to consecrate them, give them to God and put them safely somewhere. And they were told they were the accursed things. Be very careful when you go in with your sword and you attack and everything and you bring these things out for God. Don't take of anything. Abstain from the accursed things. Be very careful you don't take them and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. Just hide that away, because that gets us in the future. That comes back in the next chapter, the biters. So take all the things, da -de da Right, 22. Joshua had said to the two men who'd spied out the country originally in Joshua 2, go into the harlot's house, Rahab's house, and from there bring out the woman and all she has, as you swore to her. And the young men who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab, her father, her mother, her brothers, and all that she had. And so they brought out all her relatives and left them outside the camp of Israel. But they burned the city and all that was in it with fire. Only the silver and gold and the vessels of bronze and iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. And Joshua spared Rahab the harlot and her father's household and all that she had. And so she dwells in Israel to this day because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho.
Rahab had done exactly what they said. She tied the cord on the scarlet cord on the window. She gathered in her family, her mother, her father, her brothers, and the possessions that she had. Because they were obedient to their promise, because she was obedient, her life was spared. She was brought out. Immediately she was put outside the camp. The camp was in a state of holiness because of the war and their dedication to God. They were placed outside of the camp initially. But over time, as it says, they dwelt in Israel to this day, the time of the writing of this. And as we saw in the genealogy of Jesus, she then marries one of the people way back in the older line. And then Joshua charged them at this time, saying, Cursed be the man before the Lord who rises up and builds this city, Jericho. He shall lay its foundations with his firstborn, and with his youngest he shall set up its gates. And so the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame spread throughout all the country. The last charge that the Lord says, and he may not say this every time, but this was the first battle, the first city taken. God commanded that city should never rise again. They should never rebuild Jericho. Cursed be the man before the Lord who rises up and builds this city Jericho again. He will lay its foundation with his firstborn and his youngest he shall set up his gates. And that's actually what happened. I love these things in the Bible. They're in there for a reason. There's so much, I mean, as John said in his end of his gospel, if we wrote down everything Jesus said and did, we'd feel, you know, we'd, we'd have to carry a lorry full of Bibles around with us every time we come to church. Um, so you only get what God in his wisdom for some reason decided should be in here. And so sometimes if two things happen that back each other up, God will make sure they're both in there because they're important to show that what he said does then happen and back up. Something else may not be. But in this case, we find out 500 years later in 1 Kings 16.34, a man called Heel, Heil, H-I-E-L, of Bethel, started to try and rebuild the city of Jericho. And both of his sons, his firstborn and his youngest, Abiram and Sagub, you can read this in 1 Kings 16, 34. Both of them died as young children while he tried to rebuild this city. Because it's what God had said. Don't matter, it's 500 years later, nobody can even remember the curse given that it would happen. But God always will hold his word. His promises and his curses. That's the correct thing, the opposite to a promise. The Lord was with Joshua and his fame spread throughout the country and all the people, the whole land, really start to fear at what is going to happen and what the Israelites are going to do strange it's a weird way of taking a city but it's God and it's all God and it's not them at all they couldn't have taken the city probably even with all their people the attacking they could have maybe surrounded it for a long time but God wanted to do something extraordinary again a miracle special only he could do to teach them something they couldn't easily get the wall down, but once the wall's down, they have to do the work. They've got to go in and do the fighting. God, God doesn't then wipe all the people out while they all stand there watching via some invisible hand. They then have to go, ransack the city, go through it street by street. Work, you know, hard, painful, um, etc. But the thing they could not do, God did. Let's pray.
Please, I pray, Lord, that you would not let your word depart from us, Lord. You promise that your word goes forth, Lord, and it will accomplish all that you purpose it to. So I pray for what you've said to each of us, or shown to each of us, maybe from different bits of it today. Lord, let that word fall on good soil within us. Lord, faith and an open heart and place. Help us to respond, Lord, to the things that you've said. I pray, Lord, for every person and the people not here who are part of our family, Lord. I pray for what you alone know, even we often don't, what people are going through, Lord. I pray for their struggles, Lord, and their fights, Lord, and the things that attack them, Lord. And I want to just pray that word into those situations. Father, that you would come and you would intervene. Lord, that you would do a miracle. You would change the situation. Lord, where they cannot do it themselves. You would show who you are, Lord. Help us, I pray, the preparation, the dedication, the faith that, that the Israelites had, Lord, is all what was needed here in this situation, Lord, and you, you need to find that in us, Lord. So, Father, change us, create, these things within us Lord so that we can be the right people at the right time in your plan Amen